Dear Amy, I'm getting ready to have a conversation with a nationally syndicated advice columnist. What should I ask her? Signed, Intercompass Host. That's right, my guest today gives advice to millions of readers each week. And today on Intercompass, we're gonna find out how and why she does that. Join us. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Amy Dickinson, advice columnist for the Chicago Tribune since 2003 when she stepped into the shoes of the legendary Ann Landers. Her syndicated column, Ask Amy, appears daily in more than 150 newspapers nationwide, reaching more than 22 million readers. She's also the author of The Mighty Queens of Freeville, a memoir about Amy, her daughter, and the small town women who helped raise them. Welcome, Amy. Hi. You know, whenever somebody says I stepped into Ann Landers' shoes, I expect a call. Like, uh, this is Ann Landers. I'd like my shoes back. Give me back. my shoes yeah. back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. I mean, what? Uh, th th there can't be many more recognizable names in, in recent American history. Uh, were people surprised that you got the job? Well, no one more so than I, <laughs> really? actually. Yeah. Um, no, Ann Landers, completely iconic. I mean, right. there are actually very few journalists, American journalists, who have sort of attained this sort of iconic cultural status. Right, yeah. And I, um, you know, it's not surprising to anyone that there will never be another Ann Landers, but maybe I'm the new Ann Landers. Right, um, yeah. So, yeah, I was, I actually, as I went through the process of, it was a very lengthy, thoughtful process um, conducted uh, responsibly by the Chicago mm -hmm. Tribune. It involved test mark, you know, like modern journalism, sure, it yeah. involved test marketing, focus groups, and um, I'm happy to say that uh, they test marketed my Your answers. sample mm -hmm. answers and other people's for nine focus groups, and they reported to me that each of their groups uh, sampled exactly the same and that uh, all of these groups, their number one choice was to please bring Ann Landers back from the dead. Well, so, so second place, you can't why, beat that. Almost. Once that was eliminated right. as a possibility, they decided to go with me. So, so what are your credentials for this position? How do you train to be an advice columnist? Um, normally, when people ask me that, I smack them. Yep, but okay, no, sorry. Um, you know, actually, there's a tradition. Uh, it probably go well. I think it goes back to the campfire. You know, to the original mm -hmm. storytellers mm -hmm. in villages, yeah. where the village yenta would, um, you know, sit and listen to people and respond. Um, and certainly in you know in English journalism, the mm -hmm. agony ant is a very old um, yeah. kind of part of every newspaper. Um, and traditionally. I, my uh, thinking is that these people were ordinary people. Like that, that's the best part in a way. Is that the columnists are not some super. You're not a nurse. Degreed, you're yeah. not a doctor. You're not even a fake doctor like Dr. Laura. <laughs> you're just a regular person. Um, and actually, I think that readers um, understand that and they appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Now the original, uh, here's a little trivia, the original Ann Landers, mm -hmm. the original woman who wrote the Ann Landers column in Chicago was actually a nurse. Really? And um, her son contacted me, bless him. Wow. He's quite elderly now. Mm -hmm. she, she did the column for I think around five to seven years and then and passed away very suddenly. And then they launched this search, and that's how they found Epi Letterer, who Who's the wrote the long running, the one we think of when we think right, of right, and her yeah. sister, dear Abby. Mm -hmm. So, um, but her son, the, the original Ann Landers son, contacted me, and he said, "I want you to know that my mother was as sharp and funny and fun oh. as any person you can imagine, and I feel like you are her true successor. Wow, that's great. I was so tickled by that, because yeah. I think very little is known about the original Ann Landers, sure. who sort of did establish this iconic style. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, you develop your own voice and personality, and there is, I mean, there's this other side of you, the wait, wait, don't tell me side of you <laughs> that just has a good time and has, and, and there are lots of advice columnists that are known for, and, and I suppose people read because they're expecting a sarcastic snippy answer or a very bullying kind of Dr. Phil 
you know, wake up and smell right. the coffee <laughs> or, or a very pious answer or something. So in developing your own voice, well, maybe that's not the right question. Right. You just brought your own voice to right. it. Right. I have to say, I did not develop my own voice. I had it. Mm -hmm. And I think that when they were testing different columnists, it was, it was very old-fashioned. They gave each of us five sample questions, mm -hmm. five actual questions um, from, you know, an Ann Landers column, very typical yeah. advicey questions. And they invited each of us to answer these questions, and they gave us a week. So you had time to do, I presume you, you I had do loads some of research time. and thinking. And, I had a ton yeah. of time. But here's what I did. Here's where I got fresh. Mm -hmm. I decided not to take that time. I wrote um, my answers mm -hmm. as any deadline writer journalist would okay. very quickly. Yeah. I did some reporting. I actually made some calls. But I was able to finish in, you know, an afternoon. So by that same afternoon, I sent my replies back that to the editor, to yeah. and he said, oh, no, 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 everybody gets a week. <laughs> oh, yeah. take a week. Yeah. And I said, no, actually, I mean, I thought about it, yeah. and I thought, oh, I could go down to my mom's house and get get my my life advisors, all and the women in my guess life, this for a week. and we could, like, and then it would end up being like a committee wrote it, mm -hmm. and I felt like the person who takes this job is going to have to work very fast, and I do, mm -hmm. and it's got to be complete and thorough and funny and fun to read and entertaining right. yeah. and respectful. Yeah. And so I have to say that first column I wrote was exactly how I wanted to do it, and that's the day that's I decided that I would be good at it and that I really wanted the job. Before that, I wasn't quite sure. Mm -hmm. Now, you had been a columnist and a journalist before that, so it's not mm -hmm. as if this sort of deadline writing was foreign to you, but no. how is... Uh, answering then an advice letter different from reporting for a news story or preparing a weekly column? Mm -hmm. Well, I yesterday was looking at some letters for the column and started to cry because a, um, you know, a letter just made me incredibly sad. Mm -hmm. But then I was recalling when I worked for Time Magazine, I wrote a story on, um, on gun violence and it it focused on the Million Mom March, mm -hmm. where women decided to try and do something about gun violence in this country. And I interviewed 12 women whose children had been, in every case, accidentally shot uh, oh. by a gun, shot yeah. and killed. Mm -hmm. And none of these women had ever told their story before, wow. and we wept. So yesterday wasn't the first time I've cried so reporting mean. something, yeah. but... Um, I uh, feel, you know, these are real people writing to True. me. And so I care very much about what they're expressing. And I love the way people express their problems and their ethical dilemmas. Oh, I never thought about that. I mean, it must be very interesting to get to hear those different voices. It even is. Even and frankly, yeah. as a radio person, mm -hmm. I love it. It's like I can hear them. I never monkey with the writing. Uh -huh. Everybody buries the lead. They say their problem's really about this, and then at the very end yeah. they're like, and then I cheated on my wife, mm -hmm. but whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And I love sort of exploring um, really the text. trying to read into the question. Yeah, yeah, I'm an old, you know, I'm an English major. Yeah, yeah. I love sort of exploring the text and sort of responding to people as they choose to present themselves to me. I do not clean them up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I edit, I have to shorten a letter, yeah. but I love the way people write. You know, sometimes when I'm grading papers, because I am an English teacher, uh, if, if I'm having trouble staying in the game or paying attention or I'm just getting sleepy, I'll start reading their papers out loud and exactly. trying to hear their voices. And, and there is something really special about that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking it's, it's almost like, I mean, I, I'm thinking what possesses someone to write to a total stranger, but then I'm thinking of the really good plain conversations when, when they don't know you're an English teacher and so they don't watch their grammar and they just want to talk. And, and so you're, you're flying in an airplane or riding on a bus, and yeah. you launch in a conversation with a complete stranger and find yourself sharing all kinds of right. really important stories and, and sometimes intimate questions. People are incredibly intimate, and they're able to be intimate to strangers, mm -hmm. and I get that. I mean, I really understand that as somebody who is a, a member of a huge, loud, obnoxious hilarious family, you don't always want to bear your vulnerabilities mm -hmm. 
for your family. Right. And so I like that when people read my column, they feel like it's a safe place where they can, like, they, they trust me. Yeah. And you know, sometimes I, I have written, if I could reach through the newspaper and smack you, mm -hmm. I would. Mm -hmm. I mean, because sometimes people are just like so self-deluded, so kidding themselves. They, I want to run that letter because I want for other readers to go, mm -hmm. oh, you're great. Please, you know, like, yeah, please, yeah. please, please, please. That must be part of the pleasure of reading sometimes, I think. Uh, and I remember reading these a lot when I was younger. I was I was very serious reader of advice columns, and I think I thought I was, and maybe I was, sort of cultivating wisdom about how, how the world works and how people do. And I would feel so superior then at a young age if I already knew the answer that was staring this reader in the <laughs> face. But you have this nice mix of the obvious questions where maybe they're writing in knowing they need a wake-up call. Right. Maybe they are that clueless. But then some more subtle letters. I actually, I, I found one that intrigued me, just a short one. Uh, Dear Amy, what is the appropriate way to cancel gift exchanges with our relatives living in various states whom we seldom see? It goes on to say we've been exchanging gifts for a long time and it's, it's a hassle. And, do we, and, and our family has sort of wrestled with that. And, I, and the question to me is how do you politely say you don't want to do this? But your answer, do you remember your answer? I do remember my answer because, I mean, that's a case where it came from my own life. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, and actually one thing I acknowledged in my answer is, you know, this can be very tricky. Right. People love to give, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's not easy and it isn't exactly polite to tell someone that you don't want them to give to you. Right, or that you don't want to give to them. Or that you don't want to give to them. Yeah. But it, almost especially that you don't want them to give to you. Mm -hmm. And so I suggested an alternative where everybody exchanges photos, right. letters, and it's a way to keep this family in yeah. touch. And the word you used was evolve. Let this exchange evolve into something else. So you don't right. give that up, you, you move it. I thought that was so creative and interesting. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that came from like real life. We did an exchange one year in my family where we uh, gave each other pictures of the things we were not buying them and they should be glad that we weren't. I it was love a that. Confusing, but it was I interesting. love that idea. Yeah. I knew of two uh, brothers, this is sort of a legendary story, two brothers, of course they lived in Texas because all the crazy stories happen in Texas, and these two brothers started a gift exchange where one gave another in the 70s a pair of like Banlon plaid pants, like mm -hmm. bell bottoms. They were the most hideous pants ever, plus who gives somebody pants? Right. So the next year, the brother gave the pants back to the other <laughs> oh, brother, yes. but he had done something like attached, like a padlock. Our family you know. has a nightgown. A nightgown, yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. The pants ended up, over the years, the idea was to present it yeah. in a way that it could, they could not be returned, uh -huh. but they weren't destroyed. Mm -hmm. The last I heard of was one brother had uh, presented to the other in a huge tractor tire filled with cement. I but the pants it. were in there. But the pants are in there. <laughs> yeah, we have a nightgown that's 50 years old in our family that's that's taken on. But but moving on to yes, yeah, so, some of the questions are a whole lot more important and a whole lot more serious. Is your do, do you think of this as something that's kind of fun to do, or do you think of this as a really more serious calling? Oh, I think it. I think it's very serious to me. I mean, I I feel like one thing I bring to this genre is the knowledge that. First of all, advice columns are, and I explained this to the editor um, before they hired me, I said, I feel like this is an entry point to the newspaper for early readers. Sure. Traditionally, people who are learning English, my column is very widely taught in English as a second language class. Hmm. I hear from lots of kids because they start, the, the questions are short, the answers are short, and the, it's about human right. behavior. Yeah. So it's sort of inherently interesting. Um, but I, so I'm aware of what the column is really supposed to be, mm -hmm. but yeah, I take it very, very seriously. And it's kind of surprising because I'm sort of not a serious person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and maybe that's why, maybe it's less threatening to ask, ask advice from someone with a sense of humor yeah. than someone you think is going to clobber you over the head. <laughs> um, how often do you get letters where you think, boy, this person just really needs serious therapy and there's no way around that? Well, the most, actually, the most serious letters I do not run, um, but I do respond to. Oh. And, um, you know, I fortunately uh, have access to all sorts of helplines and suggestions, Good. Good. and I always say, you know, you, need, you don't need me, you need a professional. Um, so the most serious questions do not 
aren't publishable, frankly. Yeah, They're too sure, serious. Sure. Um, but, you know, I feel fairly qualified to sort of answer people responsibly. What kind of, I mean, you, you, do you do ongoing reading of sort of self-help books I or do. psychology books? I do, I do. I'm actually very interested in studies. Um, you know, I'll, I'll read, I'll try to keep up with the latest thinking about ADD, for instance, or about um, uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, addiction is incredibly tricky. And the thinking about addiction has changed. The thinking about how to treat addictions has changed. Right. It's not thought of an attitude and behavior thing as right. much as a, as a real matter. Or a problem. choice. Yeah. Like right. a choice. Like, yeah. as long as you choose to drink. Right. Um, but also the idea of tough love. I mean, you probably remember mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s this idea that tough love worked and that it was the really the only thing that worked. Yeah. But one of the things uh, researchers have learned about addiction is that some people, you know that I, concept of bottoming out? Mm -hmm. Well, some addicts, their bottom, their low bottom is overdosing, it's yeah. death. Yeah. And I just think that if once people realized this, um, the attitude towards addiction became much more nuanced and it needed to be. There must be all kinds of cultural attitudes that are slowly shifting over time where maybe depending on the generation of the letter writer you 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 have to sort of work to shift attitudes or to absolutely and i think that's one of my jobs is to mm. sort of tell grandma that uh you're not going to get the handwritten thank you note but you, but you shoot for an email that mm -hmm. would be awesome yeah you know yeah right so. right so so meet in the middle somewhere yeah um what are there fundamental principles maybe that that guide you that you won't that you won't bend on or do you sometimes feel like you want to write an answer that says well if you're a christian here's my advice but if you're a uh, something else, here's mm -hmm. my advice. Um, well, I feel like I've, I'm doing my job well when people, and I, and I am a Christian, and I'm a faithful Christian, um, but I don't proselytize, and um, I th feel like I'm doing my job well when people accuse me of sort of being anti-Christian. Actually, I, I'm very um, fascinated by religion and faith and mm -hmm. spirituality. So I tend to run a lot of letters in my column about the tension between a person's religious practice, faith practice, and their their real life. Sure. Yeah. Um, a kid, for instance, who doesn't want to go to church anymore mm -hmm. and what to do about that mm -hmm. and what to say and how to approach that. Yeah. Um, but there's no question in my mind that I am a sort of Western, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant culturally, and mm -hmm. I come at my column with this basic, with a little intellectual um, brush, broad brush mm -hmm. over that. Um, but that's my basic point of view, and it's fairly clear. And we do all choose our counsel, and so people who write to you probably understand to some degree this perspective that you're going to bring your answer from, right? right. And also, I mean, oh boy, am I going to get into trouble here? I'm just, I need to oh, think this do. through. Oh, don't think it through, Amy, just say it. But I do think that there is a sort of an objective baseline of right and wrong, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no matter what faith practice you are or are not. Sure and that this involves sort of the ethical challenges of everyday life mm -hmm. and um, you can, you know, I think it's probably always wrong to cheat on your husband. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, I feel yeah. comfortable going way out on a limb and saying that that's a bad You're thing. You gotta take that risk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Um, are, there, are there questions that you dread pulling out of the mailbag that, that you I don't know, that you wish would go away, or maybe that you wish wouldn't have to be asked? Um, well, there are a lot of questions from kids that, um, that I, I answer a lot of questions from children. Mm -hmm. And I mean by children, I mean usually around age eight, you know, through teen yeah, years. Sure. And um, I wish that I didn't have to answer another letter from a kid who can't figure out how to make his parents stop yelling. Sure, yeah, you know? right. Like, right. do we have to keep, you know, do we have to keep educating parents how dangerous, how traumatic this is to lay your adult concerns to fight in front of to kids children and for divorced families mm -hmm. to, um, 
to send messages through their children, to speak through their children. I mean, do we have to keep, do we really have to keep educating people, right. adults, about how to parent? Yeah. Well, and, and at some level, it must be that children who are writing to you are writing to you because they can't ask their parents, mm -hmm. and there's something sad in that. Right. There are also kids who are probably just reaching out or rebelling or whatever. I mean, there were certainly times in my childhood with wonderful parents that I would have asked any other adult first. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever feel touchy about um, sort of going over the head of the parent when when no, I I swear ask, I don't care it. I don't care what the parents think or going over their heads and one of the thing things I'll say to a kid is well I'm not your mom like I mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I would do mm -hmm. um, I always when kids write to me. I always think about the kids that are reading, the yes. other kid, yeah. the other kid that didn't write to me, but who's thinking. But who wonders about the answer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just the other day I answered a letter from a from a 17-year-old girl who had lashed out in anger at her mother, and she had said, I can't wait to go to college and get away from you. Mm -hmm. And she said, this isn't the first time I've said it. And it's not the first time any kid said right. that to their parents. But I, I hurt her so badly, yeah. I wonder if she'll ever forgive me. Yeah. And I said, you need to. And she said, my mother said to me, you've been so disrespectful. It's hurt my feelings so much. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And this girl's reaching out to me wow. and asking me for how to make, me, it right. how make it right. And what a wonderful yeah. letter. Right. And I said, you've got to. Take your mother out for coffee. You need to treat. You got to work at it because yeah. you have to do this outside the home, mm -hmm. and you have to like oh, take her hand wow. and apologize. So apologize. what you're saying is you need. I mean, well, you have to take this out of the you home have to connect. so that it's special, so yes. that it's different, yeah. so that neither one of you will ever forget mm -hmm. the day you did this. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the so the solution has to be of the magnitude of of the problem. Right. You have. It's serious. So treat it seriously. Who does your daughter go to for advice? Hmm. Well, fortunately, my daughter's so perfect. No. <laughs> How you old know, is your daughter? She, I have a 20-year-old. Oh, okay. So. Um, and she she goes to college. And, you know, I, I have to think I've done a good job with her because she, um, unlike other kids I know in college who call their parents every day or twice a day, or my daughter, we speak once a week about, she writes letters to me. Remember those oh, letters? Yeah. You write them out on paper, right. stamp? I she and I send letters back and forth. Your book, The Mighty Queens of Freeville, that's how I met your daughter. Um, tell us about the book, what, what generated that, and, and what's it about? Well, I, I kept wanting to write an advice -y book, or rather my agent kept wanting me to write an mm -hmm. advice book. And I couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it. And I was spending my summers in my hometown, where I grew up, where my family has lived since in upstate seven, New York. Upstate New York. Um, my family has lived in the Finger Lakes district in, in the village where I was born. Mm -hmm. They've lived there since 1790. And so I have very, very deep roots. And I was in Freeville at the time. I was wrestling with this whole book thing. And I thought to myself, um, I have other stories I want to tell. And I, um, <clears throat> I called my agent. I said, I'm really sorry. Not going to do the advice book. She said, oh, brother. Oh, brother. <laughs> All right, what do you want to write about? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm dying to write about livestock. And she just started uh -oh. to laugh. <laughs> yeah. She said, I don't even know what you're talking yeah. about, but I like it, so go for it. <laughs> oh. And so the first chapter I wrote is called Livestock in My Kitchen. And it's about my relationship with the animals in my life and how I grew up on a dairy farm, so I've had a very complicated relationship with some very large, nasty, and very stupid animals. But not typically in your kitchen. Not in my kitchen. But the livestock in my kitchen ended up being a very overweight um, tabby cat named Pumpkin oh, okay. who who graced our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so sort of inspired by this animal that it made me think about all of the animals in my world. So anyway, yeah. I, I just sort of went from topic to topic and it, and it turned out I had a memoir and um, even though I chose to write about animals first, it was the people I lingered on because I am fortunate enough. Um, I was a single parent very, very early on in my daughter's life. Mm -hmm. And um, I brought her to my hometown. We were living in London, London, England, as my mother London. calls it. Yes. 
And I, I went home because I didn't have anywhere else to go. Mm -hmm. I had a toddler and um, we landed in my sister's spare bedroom. Mm -hmm. And the women in my family who all live in my little home village of 550 people, they helped me get on my feet. Wow. Yeah. And they continue to mentor me. I, my aunt, I was at the airport this morning, and my aunt, my phone rang. It was my aunt, and she said, "Hey, we're having coffee at the Queen Diner." I said, "Oh, I'm in Detroit." <laughs> well, I was going to ask if you ever see situations around you, or like, do do you have to suppress the urge to give advice where it's not being requested? I do. Yeah. I do. Um, I normally, actually, I'm not a, I don't like to jump in. I mean, I actually am not a natural born advice giver. In fact, my, my older sisters thought it was hilarious really? when I got this yeah. job. Because my job in my family as the youngest is to just take all the advice, right. yes. not to give it. Well, at least you understand that. Right. At least I get that. Well, so maybe this is just a, this is, this is a forum for you to finally get to do what you've never right. been able to do in the family dynamic. Thank you so much. My guest today has been Amy Dickinson. Her column, Ask Amy, is syndicated by the Chicago Tribune. She's also the author of the memoir, The Mighty Queens of Freeville. I'm Karen Soppy. Thank you for watching Inner Compass.